want to start with um, any comments on the draft on, you know, the process or the application? Yeah, I sent some comments over to DD and to the inspection office because I wasn't sure what email. Okay, I, could, I, resp I couldn't open that. Oh, okay. I, I could open it and I sent it back to him, but he says that it doesn't look like there were, he couldn't find any different changes. So, okay, so point that out. Yep, for the. The one that start has the title process for seasonal RV. Yep. Um, where it says attach a copy of the letter of approval. It's actually a permit. Okay. And because it would either be a request for determination or a full notice of intent. Um, yeah. So that's, I had said that if, if it's within 200 feet of high water mark, they will require a permit from conservation. Minimum, a request for determination maximum would be a notice of intent. Um, under C, 3C, the letter of approval should be permit of approval from the commission again. Okay. Under D, um, I was questioning whether or not you wanted it from the date the application was submitted because most cases it's the date that it's been approved for permits. So that was just a question. Or issued, whatever, something like that. Yeah, or issued. Right. We, we could do it. We could do it uh, issued. I, I was I was thinking when I actually had received it. Yeah. Well, because with like planning board or conservation commission, right. it doesn't matter. It's yep, no, that's a good point. So date of approval to change it to. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And yeah, and under E on that when you say the commission will need to re-inspect the property. Um, I didn't see anywhere. Are you referring to the initial inspection would be during the permit process? Well, I, I probably didn't have it clear. I read it here again. Um Basically, if there was a change, you know, if they're adding another camper or taking one out or moving them, that you, you may need to see it. That thought of that should be added in there. Yeah, usually what we do is we say that they need to submit a letter, a, a letter of change to the okay. commission. And then the commission will look at it and say, is it uh, small enough that it doesn't need to go back for a review of the permit? If it's a large change, it may require a permit. Okay. All right. Like I said, I couldn't open that up, but if it's all on there, we'll just change that for all the conservation. That'd be great. Yep. Thank you. Chief was just calling me. I wonder if he's having trouble getting on. I'm just going to grab this quick. Oh, Bill, congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, my daughter was working as hard during the planning board meeting as I was. I know, right? <laughs> yes, we have Claire Margaret Emery, born on uh, March 2nd. She's very cute. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> congrats, Bill. Congrats to the parents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We just uh, just brought her home today, Aww. and uh, she is tiny. She's smaller than their cat at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> now you get to be the doting grandfather versus the strict father. Yeah, well, we've we've already had uh, almost four years of practice on that. Oh, She's okay. our second. Ah. <laughs> Chief, we were just discussing uh, changes to the little draft here, um, and conservation had some real good points to change in that. Yeah, yeah, I did a new format for you, Tommy, and I don't know if I can share the screen. I can show you what I have, and we can add in. I did, like, a checklist. Awesome. Good. So I don't know. Is it possible to share on the so, screen? Hang or? on. I have to. I'm yeah, the host, and, and I have to authorize it. 
which I just did. So go ahead. Paula, do you want him to change it? Well, I know it's a repeat, but we'll go over and change it right now on there so you like the, how it looks. Sure. I mean, we can we can take a look at it and see what it says. Mike just has so much free time on his hands, you know? <laughs> I just did it this afternoon. <laughs> I, did, I figured you didn't You're have too time. Much. I don't worry about it yet. Can everybody see that? Oh, yes. 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 Very nice. <clears throat> so I just broke it down this week into it still, but I broke it down by the different divisions. So it started out with the property information for everybody, uh, with the physical address, mailing address of the property owner. I don't know how many RVs they would have, but we could add in additional ones if you want. Um, so we would have inf information for each one. <clears throat> then we yeah, was, remember that correctly. Was my questions. If there were more than one or two RVs, where would they put that information? Yeah, so I just put two here. We could add an additional page if we needed to. Uh, the other, the other part was if Can I, I remember make a correctly. Suggestion? Just wonder if I can make a suggestion on the participants being listed. I don't know if landowners maybe you know have an Uncle Tommy in or three weeks a month then uncle auntie sue and so it's better just to have the landowner keep a list of who's on site at that particular time and put the permit in for how many campers he wants i believe one of the prior meetings said that that emergency management or whatever um, automated call would only go to so i just don't know from a permitting standpoint if all of a sudden every three weeks you know the uncle leaves and the aunt comes in is this going to mean a new permit has to go in is it another hundred dollars what's that going to mean so i'm just suggesting that maybe it's just the landowner coming out and saying hey i want a permit for five rvs uh, they pay the license fee and then they're required to keep the listing up to date subject to any inspection that this committee advises to say hey within 24 hours i want to be able to see your list if somebody wants to check that out and just a suggestion. I yeah. think it would save time. I think I remember it a little different is that if it was someone just coming in for a weekend, we wouldn't need their name. But if they were going to be there long term, you know, more than just a couple days, they would like if they're going to be there for three weeks or four weeks or a month. Um, that they would have to have their name there just in case. I mean, what happens if you can't get in touch with the owner of the property? Right. I agree with you, Paula, but I, I think what, what revision document are you going to have, right? So if all of a sudden that if somebody cycling out there. Sorry, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Paula, and, and his kind of in his argument there, if you just list a landowner, it's just like the owner of a business property. If you can't get a hold of me at, at my business, I'm the only person. You know, it, it doesn't really go down an employee list. It, it goes to the business <laughs> owner or the landowner. Before, before we get into the, like, just the RP information, just the, I mean, there's, there's requirements just to start it out and it might make it more clear if we go through it first and then we can make the decision on the RV owner information if you want. But from what, from what I was told was immediately conservation has to approve if you're going to be putting the RVs on the site and you have to provide them with the number of RVs that you were going to want on the site. And I couldn't remember if it was 20 or 25 feet, you know, the spacing, all that other information um, and obtain that approval letter from conservation. So regardless of whether you have RV owner's information, the property owner would have to determine how many RVs they were planning on that. Is that not correct for the season? Correct. Right, correct. And I think we do want to have a census of how many RVs we are posting. I think that's useful information to have. So that was the first part. The second part was for, you know, the Board of Health. So they were second on the list for just determining that there's an appropriate way of removing waste. 
Um, right. And then for us on the fire department side, so public safety, it just included fire, police, and emergency management. It was, you know, just ensuring that um, we have a site map with just the access to the site. And then uh, it was discussed that I couldn't remember if it was 20 or 25 feet of spacing that we had discussed between, I think it was a board of health suggestion as well. Uh, it's 25 feet, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that would all be part of that too. So again, the, the property owner would have to determine how they would want to do that. And then we had put on here that the property and RV owners just register with Nixle. There's no, it's not like we're going to be calling you to, you know, sell you stuff. It's just, it's the Nixle system, which allows us to provide you with a reverse 911 call. And I hyperlinked all these different sites that you can click on to go to, to get that and sign up for that information. That way, if there wasn't a weather event or something came up that we needed to get in touch with you, we could actually just encircle the whole bank of the river and get that message out to everybody who signed up in that area. So um, anyways, those, that was the, the concept of that. Um, and then it's just, you know, the signing off that you're, you're stating everything's correct. And then the building department is the final uh, keeper of all this. So everything, the permit fees, everything goes to the building department. And then this part is more of a checklist for Tommy to check off that he's received all the required permit information and the fees attached. And then there's just the information on a, you know, it's a three year, three year uh, permit. Um, if there's any changes just to change them uh, with, with Tommy. So again, the RV owner stuff, if you want to discuss that more, I just want to make sure you understood the, the reason why we were trying to get a total number or, you know, what the max number would be um, just so we have that layout for the site. Yeah. So and I, I thought that there was going to be some restrictions on how many RVs could be at a site, not just spaced 25 feet apart. Well, yeah, and that's up to the con that's why they have to go to conservation first. Right. On the then, planning board. Planning board is going to determine square footage or amount first. Yeah, and, we and we are working. As as yeah, planning board's working on trying to provide some guidance. Now, the issue is that lot sizes are all over the place. There's uh, one lot off of um, Aquavita Road that I think is only something like 40 feet of frontage, but it's an acre and a half in area. Um, whereas other someone uh, who I think is on tonight has uh, something like 400 feet of river frontage. So it doesn't lend itself, or at least we haven't worked out a formula yet that um, to really address that. Um, you know, we're talking about a certain minimum square footage for um, a, a park RV parking site um, <clears throat> and spacing between the RVs, but we really haven't been able, haven't come to terms with how many can be on a parcel. Um, although at some point you can't, you don't have, nobody has that many relatives out there that they're going to overcrowd a parcel. If you do start, um, if you have a large parcel and you want to start having people rent, space to people, then you're getting into the campground regulations. And so that's one thing, it, it may be somewhere we could work into the checklist. Or the uh, is, this site, uh, uh, is this site being rented? Yeah. Or is this, is so, this RV renting from the owner? So one of the things in that email I sent you to make some changes to the drafts bylaw that you guys have proposed, Mm -hmm. We put in a square foot price. The frontage doesn't really apply as it's a temporary structure. So it, it shouldn't matter if you only have 40 feet frontage. A camper, you can park it either way um, to the lot lines. And, and one of the things that a lot of people are concerned with is there's state guidelines to what you can do. Uh, 105 CMR section 440 has minimum standards for developed family type campgrounds. So if the town is trying to be more restrictive than what the state already has in place, I think that's where the problem lies. So anything over three campers needs a permit. 
the special permitting process. Um, so that's why itself. we had suggested to you to, to go to three. And then anything over that would, would click in the, the state requirements. Actually, they're not state requirements. Those requirements, well, it's written by the state law, but they'll be signed off by the local board of health department. So <laughs> any applications for three or more right now, based upon the law, would have to go through um, local board of health. And that's actually going to be one of the first things brought up at the seven o'clock meeting. Right. And I, I apologize if that's what I meant. There was already something said, though, in state that, that goes to the local board of health for permitting. Oh, Glenn, and that's when does it cross over into something if it becomes a commercial venture? Where does the town step in or planning board <clears throat> or zoning requirements kick in? Three or more families or camping groups. Three or more? <clears throat> It, it it, hello. It becomes it becomes an, um, a business when it's um, for profit or a nonprofit um, is involved, like a Girl Scouts um, using a camp as well as, um, you know, it could be churches. It could be anything there, because as we all know, nonprofit does profit, but they have to distribute the funds afterwards with their with the uh, codes. So that's basically why it turns into like a campground at that time. But if it's just somebody's property and they're not charging, then it's still like, Bill, you mentioned that last week. You were dead on. It's for profit. or And they had to put something in there as well, just so nonprofit couldn't take advantage of that as well, just because of sanitary and other certain areas. Well, correct. So ab absolutely, if someone is renting camp campsites to three or more people, they have triggered the Board of Health regulations. The area that is less clear is if you're not renting it to someone, how many, how many RVs could be in an extended family on a 40 foot wide, 1.4 acre parcel? And I think that's, that's what we're wrestling with that we'd like to have some sort of a, some sort of a standard that would not not create a density issue. Uh, Bill, um, is there, I mean, I understand that last week I was in the meeting and I did see how they wrote, um, drew the picture um, for the RVs. But as we know, everybody goes the opposite. It's parallel. Why could it just, um, as long as the property frontage holds the recommendation spacing um, with 15 feet from the other property owner and 50, you know, from the property owners that they're allowed to put along the frontage. And if there's some type of writing about like double stacking or something where um, that could be put in that, you know, I'm just saying like, so if someone has like say 500 feet and it's, I'm using this as an example and it's a campground and it's like 65 feet and it's a 40 foot camper. So if they have that many family members, why couldn't they, um, you know, basically go up to that amount of campers and they hit that 15 feet barriers as long as it falls into the parameters of the site? Yeah, Kevin, you're, you're breaking up badly. I missed a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I think I got the gist of it, though. So you know, the issue is if, if we could, and I'm not sure if we can, but if we could extend the uh, provisions of the uh, campground regulations to all users, I think everyone would be happy with, well, most everyone would be happy with that. It would, uh, it would address concerns about, but I think uh, Mark Britton last night or on Tuesday night raised the issue about uh, why shouldn't everybody have to have a uh, sandy can so that we don't have you son of a do with. okay there's that <laughs> well I think what everyone has to realize and I don't like being the bad guy but state law is going to limit how close to the water you can get with an RV. 
um, the Wetlands Protection Act and the River, uh, River Protection Act. Um, those are going to limit. You're not going to be right on the water. Um, you know, if there's vegetation there, there's only a certain amount that you're going to be able to clear or maintain. Things like that. So just to kind of put it out there, because there's this process, there is not a right given here for people to automatically have a camper on their property. Paula, can you tell us what law that is? And do you know the setback currently? Um, the Wetlands Protection Act includes the riverfront area. The riverfront area is 200 feet and the state law requires um, the first 100 feet pretty much to be undisturbed. The commission under, you know, under duress with DEP had to either ask a property owner to remove a, a pavilion that was constructed and who they had come for the permit. If there is room to locate things outside of that first hundred feet, they have to be located outside that first hundred feet. I'm assuming since it's wetland protection, this um, affects more than just RVs then, right? It, wouldn't it be all houses, all sheds, all anything? Yep. Okay. Because I, I, there's houses that aren't even 200 feet off the, right. the river. Those, the houses that existed, that are existing now, are grandfathered. And certain um, locations might have a grandfathering too. Proving that would have to have documentation. Going back to... I want to say the pre nineties because that's so when if you, riverfront regulations came into so effect if, in the nineties. So if you have documentation that you've had a camper within 200 feet of the Connecticut river prior to that, then your grandfather didn't also Paula? Uh, not necessarily because if you didn't have a permit and you went in and you cleared within the hundred feet, or within the floodplain, that wouldn't grandfather you. Right, yeah, can, can I bring up something as you were mentioning about, because there's houses that are closer to the waterfront and that if they're grandfathered in, that's one thing. But as soon as they make any changes to that house, um, they're opening it all, that null and voids kind of the grandfathering and then they have to go with conservation in, you know, DP, whatever, and they might have to raise that house. That's a couple issues we're dealing with right now. Yeah, it's the value of the house and the improvement value of the house, the percentage of the improvement over the valuation. And I think it isn't it like 10%, something like that. Yeah, you need an engineer stamp. The engineer has to do all the calculations just for the building permit, um, mm -hmm. even to repair a deck. Unfortunately, and and um, so there is there is a property. I know know that Tim couldn't issue the permit and until he had that. And unfortunately, it's not safe. But until he had the engineering, he couldn't issue that permit. Okay, so it's ninety six, August seventh and ninety six. It popped up. Thank you. Yeah. So. The question I had, and, and we have ZBA representation. Um, so if the ZBA had issued a permit, and that would be grandfathered, Paulette, if they had they had gone for the permit and they issued it, would that be? Now that's something we'd have to clarify because I know the grandfathering is for a house, not necessarily a temporary structure. So we would have to um, find out what the law is or what the court rulings have been on things like that in the state. I can't okay. give an easy answer to that. Yeah, the ZBA's primary jurisdiction comes from chapter 40A, which is the Zoning Act, just as the planning board's jurisdiction. 
So um, the ZBA as a board of appeals doesn't take appeals from the uh, Conservation Commission. That goes directly to DEP in Boston. Um, so the ZBA really doesn't have a role in, um, they have a zoning role, but not a conservation role. Right, but it, it may be something, I think what they were thinking of is if there was a permit issued from the zoning board, that may be proof that it existed at that time or before that time. So, but temporary structures and the Wetlands Act, we would have to look into that. I don't know that answer off the top of my head. So we, we kind of segued right into the plan. Um, it, uh, Mike, would you be able to take the plan down or I'll take it down if you uh, want me to, um, so we could get all the pictures back, all the faces back on the screen? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so th there's been some evolutionary stuff that we've talked about. I don't know how many of you had a chance. Some of you were at our planning board meeting on Tuesday. Um, and in light of all of these other jurisdictional issues that have popped up, we uh, are sort of leaning towards a variation of the, what Johnny Michikoski sent around. Um, we're talking about taking the ZBA out of the camper permitting business and the planning board will handle the creation of a bylaw but we're going to try to leave as much of this as possible to the building inspector and not have to go through public hearing processes. Um, and what we are trying to do is just create some guidance for the building inspector, uh, some broad parameters. And, um, you know, certainly to the extent that we, what we don't, what we're hoping to avoid is basically creating uh, campgrounds down there, relatively dense campgrounds. We're just trying to get a handle on what's a reasonable spacing between units. And um, I think somebody mentioned 25 feet, I think. I think that was okay with uh, Board of Health. And I think that was okay with the fire department to have a 25 foot separation between RVs. Yes, the Board of Health, I don't know if Board of Health is on right now, but they had suggested the 25 feet fire department's fine with that. Yeah, that's the number the Board of Health is comfortable with, 25 feet. Okay. Um, the uh, state campground regulations provide some square footage suggestions. Um, and if we can incorporate those by reference, I think we're probably most of the way there. So the way the math works, so the state guidelines say 1,400 square feet, which includes 200 square feet of parking. Uh, doing the math based upon the 25-foot offset with a 45 or a 40 by 10-foot camper would be 2,275 feet. Roughly, it'd be 65 by 35. So it'd be 2,275 would satisfy Board of Health and satisfy um, the fire department. And if you maybe add 200 square feet based on the other regulation for parking, basically, I mean, 2,500 would be meet all the requirements that have been thrown out there for social distancing and, um, again, egress and not blocking people in. Okay. Casey didn't know I'm a numbers guy. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that the, uh, I just checked the, uh, uh, the regulation and it's, um, it is, uh, but, 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 uh, um, uh, each campsite minimum width of 25 feet, minimum area of 1,200 feet square feet plus an additional 200 square feet for parking. So it's 1400 square feet. Um, 
minimum. But uh, yeah, if we could say 2,500 and with maintaining 25 foot spacing between units, um, that should uh, allow people to fill up as much of the desirable area. Uh, I'm sure being six, uh, six RVs back from the river, is, if the lot's even big enough for that, is not going to be anyone's ideal location. Perhaps I'm wrong. Would you want six on there? Because doesn't that kick it into a commercial, like a campground? Anything over three? Well, it's it's three, but it talks in terms of uh, the campground definition. Is uh, it actually it's uh, three or more family, three or more families or camping groups. So that's ambiguous about whether that's three or more RVs. Uh, a family might have two RVs a piece, and you have. Two families, you may have five RVs. Um, but it talks about families or camping groups. Um, um, so I'm not sure that the ultimate number is a concern as long as there is the spacing. And yeah, at some point, if you want to have eight units on your lot, you're going to have to demonstrate to the Board of Health that you are not doing this for profit and collecting rent makes it for profit even if you don't cover your costs now now for the most part uh, you know like johnny you might be able to answer this say there are like uh one person has five family members that come out but they're not always all out there at the same time so is it where a good majority of them all five campers would be out there at the same time if they had a big enough spot. And that's why we talked about the square footage and back to the last meeting we had when my family camped down off Aquavita, there was four of us that had campers, my parents, myself, and two of my sisters that went down there. And there were certain occasions that we'd have friends come down for the weekend, but just ours alone, there was four campers down there. So the problem is, is it's like you're restricting people to use their land for why they bought it. They want to use it for recreation. So we're trying to come up with, with a fair number. And I think the square footage is a good, good way to go with it. Yeah, and just, you know, everyone has to understand that the state regulations regarding riverfront area is the state regulations. And then you've got the floodway issues or floodplain issues. So commission's going to have to look at what other communities have done or how they have permitted it, or if there are any, in fact, any court cases governing this too. So that's what we're going to have to look at. Actually, Paulette, just to let you know, the town of Hadley was involved in a court case in 2018 when actually the Board of Selectmen signed off on a property. Um, it was a civil case that was brought against this person that been having too many RVs. And the town did settle and allowed the person to have X number of campers and X number of tents. So this case was as recent as 2018 that the right. town of Hadley actually settled with a but, landowner. But they never spoke to the Conservation Commission or got permits from the Conservation Commission, which the Select Board doesn't have jurisdiction over the Wetlands Act. So even though the town settled, that they settled that, I believe, which would be zoning or permitting, but that doesn't settle the Wetlands Protection Act issues. Conservation was actually named in that settlement agreement. And it was 2018? Yeah. 
Yeah, I actually saw that. I, I pulled that up today as well. Annis, do you remember that? I, I've been on the commission a long time. I don't remember. I so believe it's Ted Michikowski's campground off of um, Route 47, South Hockenham, whatever, or Lawrence Plain maybe at that point. And uh, conservation did not go do any permitting or wasn't asked to do any permitting on it. So we may be mentioned in there as having an issue with the situation, but we weren't involved in the decision or anything. And the select board can't say we've settled this for conservation commission. And they also um, at that time were supposed to go in front of the ZBA to get a, a permit. Um, and I've been here six years and in that 2018, even if it did get approved, uh, nobody did come forward to apply for a permit. So they never did that either. So there's a lot of I's and a lot of to dot and a lot of T's to cross. And we're just trying to make it as easy as possible, um, at least to put out there where people need to go, what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So but, when we first initiated this, uh, we were not aware of the extent of the Conservation Commission's role in that. <clears throat> and we thought it was important that someone have some oversight over what's going on. Now that we've dug a lot deeper into this, um, that's why we have modified our position quite a bit. It, I'll just reiterate, the, uh, the zoning piece is a fairly small slice of the pie uh, compared to the other pieces. So uh, we're, we're backing off somewhat, but that's, we're making it easier procedurally to a, to a degree, but there are still going to be hoops to jump through to make use of the land. And not everyone will be able to use the land for what they purchased it for. That's my gloom and doom. Sorry. Um, and I would just add to that. My concern is um, monitoring or enforcement to know that people are following their permits and their, their rules and that there aren't too many people showing up more than what is in the permit and stuff like that. Over the course of three years, things may get a little loose or a little sloppy. Now, was it, was it Rob that was mentioning at the beginning about if you, having family members coming in and out? Yes. Okay. So, one thing I kind of thinking of is that when it comes to the point that depending on how many or so gets determined, and then you come to do the actual permit to get from our department, that because it's three years and it's a hundred dollars per RV. So if you know, like you're certain your aunt is coming, you know, comes every year for a certain amount of time, and then your uncle or whatever, then they should probably register and, and get their permit that's going to last them for three years. So whether they're coming in and out. So this way we have, um, you know, who the owner is, if there's any issues that they're not around and something happens. So that is more of the big, huge concern is to have the information on every trailer that's there. Yeah, I, I agree. So it just I asks the question now, when do you need, right? So when does that person have to pay the $100? Is it one week, two week, four week, six week? Is it it's there for the full 180 days? So Uncle Tom's there for two weeks, leaves. Auntie Sue comes in for three weeks, leaves. So at any given time, you have one RV leaving, you have one RV coming, but is that now two permits? Well, the, the, well, the, the permit is per RV. Well, we, we, that's just a suggestion. I, I yeah. believe you have to go through the select board and, and that, but uh, so why couldn't it be per spot? That's something I was going to bring up. I mean, per spot. So that way there, you know, if, if there's four campers, but they have that certain spot that it's allowed, um, we can arrange it that way. 
you know, yes, I would suggest just do. having, I would just suggest having one permit fee per, per lot. I mean, I don't think we should try to do every RV. I think just trying to get the information. And I mean, I think the whole point of, of this was more for, you know, for public safety and for ensuring that we're protecting the riverfront than to make it a, you know, a fee, a fee, um, you know, to, to obtain fees. In my opinion, I think just one fee for the property, as long as the, you know, if the building inspector or fire department has to go out, um, it just covers those costs for that. I, I don't think we should be asking per, I think it would be a lot easier just for one for the site. Um, I'm going to disagree with that because mm -hmm. if you are permitting one RV versus five RVs, there's a lot more enforcement or uh, verification involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do one permit, you could do one permit and then the person has to say how many RVs and then their fee is based on the maximum number of RVs right. that put on the property. Hello? Yeah, and I think that's where, um, I think that's where Rob was kind of um, getting at. I think if you did, you know, with the owner, if they filled out all the paperwork, they provided you, you know, like if say their land provides, um, we'll just use it, five RVs. If the land was able to hold five RVs, when he comes down, and he says, well, okay, I'm going to have three. Okay, so he goes down and he pays for the three RVs. But say something happens, his land is allowed to have two, then he's required to go down and get two more, add two more to the lot. But exactly, I think that's where Rob was kind of getting at the beginning. If it's like five RVs, then that's what they pay for right up at front. And exactly, it's not just one fee, but you still get the $100 for each RV. So if, you know, $500, for it. That, so I, I think that's where Rob was kind of getting. I'm sorry I'm kind of talking in the circles, but um, I think we're kind of just rounding about um, kind of right at the beginning of the meeting what um, Rob was proposing mm -hmm. with the owner. And I just threw that threw that in there. I, I've gotten feedback. Um, I mean, some some people have suggested 500 a thousand for RV, and I, I believe we're going to have to go through select board anyway, but we need to present something. So that was just something thrown out there. Yeah, I, I don't think that the responsible landowners are going to balk at the fee. I mean, we understand and we, we want the enforcement. We want sanitation, board of health and all that. So I, I think if it's 100, 200, I, I don't think the landowners are going to balk at that, you know, because we're on board. We, we want, we respect the riverfronts. We want this place to be nice. We're not going to double stack, triple stack and, you know, stack them on top of each other and go vertical. It's just not going to happen. That was my feed. That was the feedback I, I got, um, you know, from a few landowners that they don't mind as long as it's enforced of the few sites that aren't being enforced. Um, and then the complaints will come in that, which will have to be acted upon, you know, that w which ones aren't having somebody come clean and, and that. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think like kind of like what Rob is saying, then if that if there are family members that are coming in and out, if they're allowed so many, say you're allowed three campers on your property, then then it would just be that you're paying for three campers, uh, you know, for three years. And so whether or not you're having different ones coming in and out, it's just that you know, that's who you're paying for, but also that we, or somebody should have all the information of whoever's there at that, any given point. Oh, exactly. And agreed. And that's, that's um, a very good point, you know, and that's, and the other thing is with the owners of the, the properties, exactly what you're saying, like Rob and everyone saying, no, everybody wants to make sure that they have an enjoyable uh, recreational use of their property. And they're not going to be double stacked and they're not going to sit there and make it look like a parking lot because what does that get for them? They can't enjoy it. This is a non, they're, they're not charging anybody. They're not doing for profit. You know, they just want, you know, family to sit there and be able to get together on weekends and everything. And especially now with all the COVID that's happening, at least we're starting to basically come to a milestone um, with vac vaccinations and everything. But the river was, you know, basically the big hangout this year because you were able to social distance and um, and enjoy one another. 
Um, so um, again, I think that's where uh, it's not like it's a, a cont- every owner is going to make sure who's going to come in onto their property is going to be a good person. They don't want to have the police knocking on their door. They don't want to have this. And if there is problems, they're going to want to know about it so they could tell these people, hey, listen, we're here as, you know, as basically we're landowners of Hadley. We're part of Hadley. We want to make sure if we have a problem with a person, please let us know. We'll make sure that person disappears because why do they want that reflecting bad on them? And that's where I'm kind of getting at. So they're going to want to know when people are, I mean, like Mitch's Island. I mean, that was just a whole disaster. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had three different owners and they all wanted to own it, but no one wanted to police it. So what happened? I mean, it just totally went crazy. And I mean, it was none of anybody's fault for Hadley or anything. It was just a lot of um, nonprofits without the regulations. So what you're doing here is makes sense. People want to make sure that they get them, uh, get the vehicles out of there safely. No one wants to lose their $30,000, you know, some people, okay, maybe 15, 15,000 to $30,000 campers. I mean, they're not tents. They don't want to lose them down the river. They're going to make sure they abide and get their camper out of there because, you know, and that's where I'm kind of getting at. It's just, you know, um, it's just definitely they value what they have. Oh, right. Tom. And that's, that's why we're trying to, th- this past year, like you said, got over bombarded with campers and we started getting a lot of complaints. And for instance, I know there was one area, they were a younger crowd um, and they had sometimes six campers and the um, other people next to them, they were getting obnoxious, loud, everything real late at night. But every time the police got called, they knew ahead of time and they all ran in. So, but you know, it was disturbing the other people, like you say, that are trying to enjoy their vacation. So we're trying to help, like you said, you guys out and take care of those people that are starting to make it unenjoyable for you guys. No, we appreciate that. And then I totally agreed. I mean, if they're giving the law enforcement any type of issues or anything, uh, you know what? They, they basically write their story. If they get arrested, they do what they have to. Then they have their day in court. A hundred percent. Not anybody should ever be abused or anything. They don't follow the rules. Guess what? You get locked up. You know, just let's be straight and forward. I agree with you 100%. There should not be that type of behavior down there. Mm-hmm. So I think it would be a good idea to have the property owner sign that form, whichever form we settle on. The property owner sign it and a declaration that the property owner understands that they're responsible for complying with the law that as, of, as it affects their parcel, their use of their parcel. Yeah, you could do it like a statement of respect on the honor system of it, you know, just kind of write something, you know, will provide, um, you know, you know, absolutely like a state of respect for, for Hadley. I, I think the way that Mike wrote up that form is perfect. And Tommy's was good, but Mike, the way you have the checklist, I, I think that's spot on. And, and everybody agrees. That's what they need. They, accountability. You need to know who's there, especially for the emergency uh, management side of it. But well, we do, so we do need to add, Chief. Then we'll just put that. It's got to be the property owner to sign that final, you know, to sign it. That's a good point. And we, and like you said, Mr. Dwyer, we should also add: is it uh, is it rented? Are any of these being rented? You know, so that's at least covered by the town if if three or more are checked off being rent. You know, yeah, that, that could be down in the uh, board of uh, board of health box. <clears throat> that okay. so you let the board of health know that you're renting if you're. Let them decide if you have triggered campground regulations. Yep. Okay. Keith, the only other thing would be that anywhere it talks about Conservation Commission, it should be listed as a permit, not a letter. Yes. Okay. So, Janice, that's a good question. This permit, is that a form document that already exists that somebody can fill out or... Is it a free form request type thing and somebody stamps, yep, okay, or? No. Because I'm still confused as to. Yeah, any permit from the Conservation Commission is going to require either a public meeting or a public hearing. If it's a public meeting, it would be a, a simple request for determination. 
depending on what you're doing and how many it may, if it goes to a notice of intent, that's a public hearing and that's a higher filing fee. So as we're streamlining this, the only part that, and, and I kind of mean, don't mean this in a bad way, it's going to come out bad. The only part that's not streamlined that I don't understand right now is conservation. What is step one to do? And can we create the same type of checklist for conservation to say, this is what you need to do. So the landowners are complying and we know what to do, just like we're doing with this particular um, permit process. Is that something that can be done? Yeah, I think so I wouldn't know where to begin. We can work on that with uh, Janice and I can work on that. Um, you know, just as with any permit, um, if you're within, you know, a certain distance of a river of a wetland, you need a permit from the Conservation Commission. So we can start with that. Um, they'll need a plot plan, you know, or something that shows where everything's located. Um, and again, it's the degree of the use of the property that will trigger and where you want to put things that will trigger whether it's a request for determination or whether it's a notice of intent. It's based on intensity of use and how close to the river you are. And that's, that's beautiful. I mean, everything you just said is Greek. So if we could get that out there in, in more English terms to, to us, you know, people that are not as well versed in these areas as you, I would appreciate that because that's where I think some of the confusion comes in. I, I don't know the difference between some of those. So that'd be a big help. Yep. All right. If you could just, if you could get me like a bullet point list and what we could do is we could have, um, we could have a, you know, a rear page, a third page that actually just goes through, you know, maybe frequently asked questions or, um, we could break up the conservation again and just, you know, your request for determination versus um, letter of intent or whatever the other one was. Um, so if you want to send me that bullet point, I can, I can add that in here the way, however you want me to do it, I'll add it in here. I just went off of, this is just all information from what DD, DD had sent out today. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can put something together, but the hardest part is, depending on where the property is, whether it's something that has to be looked at. It can't just be, yep, go ahead, you can do it. There has to be some, and in order to, and the permit is to protect the property owner too. Because if you don't have the permit, then you're considered in violation. It could not only be the commission uh, filing a enforcement, it could be the DEP coming down in and doing enforcement. So it really depends, it, and I'm sorry, this isn't much clearer. We can set some standards up, but those are not gonna be cut and dry because every piece of property is individual. So that's the other part of this. This is, this is basically the checklist for Tommy to review that everything's been, you know, they've gone to all the different departments. So this is, it wasn't intended to be all encompassing. That's why a hyperlink like uh, conservation commission. So they could get in contact with you to get the information that was needed. But then we just needed the, what, what, what has to be checked off in your section in order for uh, the building commissioner to say, okay, yes, we're good to go. That, that was the purpose of this. So I'd say the, the simpler we can make this permit checklist, if everybody agrees, the better. Yeah, and it would be a permit from the Conservation Commission, period. And the permit would either be request for determination or a notice of intent. All right, so I changed that. I The second bullet, uh, the second checkpoint is obtain permit, permit from Conservation Commission and attached application. Yeah. And it can be whichever, whichever one it has to be, if that's simple enough. Yeah, well, yeah. for us it is. Um, yeah. For applicants, you really need to have a conversation with either me or Janice. Right. This yep. is only part time. Yep. So it could be harder to get a hold of people. So 
we will do our best to work with you on it. But um, ba basically anything that happens along the river will be within our jurisdiction. If you're within at least 200 feet, if you're in the floodway, if you're within the 100 year floodplain, I think that probably covers most of the, it would cover all the shoreline <laughs> and, and back a bit. Is Greg Mesh still on the phone? He had to leave early. Okay. Just want to make sure he was he was good. I didn't know if they require a permit for the porta potties. I don't know. I can't remember if he had said there was a permit requirement for that or not. I can check. I believe he just they just need the person that's cleaning them registered. Okay. I believe. Or the the, the person that's installing them has to be uh, permitted. Yeah, Mike, I don't think a, a board health permit is required. Just I've never had to pull one for, for a Santa can anywhere. Okay. So as long as it has the name of the registered company that's cleaning it, that they're yeah, it's usually it. it's usually on the um the the town website. Well, yeah, and the, the porta potty itself has the name usually of the operator. Right. Yeah, and or that we need to know. I know a, a lady the other night was mentioning at the planning board of uh, that they have a company that comes in that takes uh, their campers. So if that's the case, then we just need to know who the company is. Um, you know, just well, things like that. So we, we can just know Greg, that the waste. I know in other communities, the town, the board of health in that town requires that company to be registered in that town. So that's probably right. how it is here. That's that's what I thought he had said, yeah, um, yeah. and I did add in the in that checklist that if the RV is equipped with, you know, with it. So if they're if you're going to actually be pumping it out of your RV, then it's RV, sandy can, or porta potty. And that's the, some of the feedback I got. People have pay so much a month for their their campers, and they see other, you know, properties that nobody's ever going out there. So. <clears throat> Oh, that form is very good. If we can just change those, Chief, that would be great. Thank you for redoing that. So, so did you want me to take off the RV owners stuff and just have landowner? Is that how we're doing it? And Bill, is that how we were planning on doing it? So the application will be the property owner, and then they'll provide what an email to us if you know what I mean. So I guess that's the only part I'm not really. But the property owner would be the applicant, but Correct. the applicant would be telling you how many spots he was applying for, because that's going to be what the the fee is based on. Correct. And yep. he'd have to show the app the the spots. <clears throat> the, but he doesn't a, have. But doesn't have to provide the the RV owner information. It's just the number of sites they'll be setting up. Well, right. I don't know. Would it hurt not to know? Uh, you know who the RV owners are in case the property owner is not around. And chief, but attach if, if additional, if additional people are going to take that spot during the year, just please attach separately yeah. the information. It might, like a, contact. Sure. it might be a space to have, if you know you're going to have three people and one spot is going to be a rotating spot. Yeah. Leave, leave in, Get all the information you can, but let the um, if there's one spot that's going to be my a different aunt's going to be here every week. Just say that. May I speak? Yeah, maybe just a secondary emergency contact, just like mm -hmm. a medical right. Just an emergency contact in case you can't get a land landover, landover even two. I'm sure. Again, the landowners will be happy to give you as many numbers as they can because they want to protect their investments and their family's investments. I phoned Don. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a property owner on Acavita Road. I've been there since 1992. Uh, I get a permit every year from the building inspector for the Sandy Can, which is $25. I've been doing that since 1992. My lot is 75 by 1,000. I have three kids plus myself, which is four trailers. Now you're telling me I got to get a permit for each trailer? Is is that what's going on? It, it's actually always been that way, but through the ZDB, ZBA. 
you were supposed to go in front of the ZBA to get the, the permit. So the planning board is trying to make it easier that it would, you know, be this formality basically in order to get the permit instead of having to go for a meeting. I, I have a uh, lifetime permit from the zoning board of appeals since 1992. I'm the person that sued the town in one. Am I still infected in that? We'd have Why to you send it in. We'll take a look. Yes. Okay. Is it, is it recorded in the registry of deeds? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, if you want to just, uh, if you have a copy of it, or if you know the book and page of the recording, uh, you can send it to uh, either the building inspector or to me at planning at hadleyma.org. Okay, very good. I'll send it. So I wonder if there's going to be a lot of others that have that. What, no. What, no. No, because what? I have the list is actually behind your desk. Mm -hmm. Down below, I think, is where there's a list in. Probably I thought, I thought that gentleman is the one that has the most. At that point, for those. No, so my recollection is Tom, there were probably not more than 10 that were ever right. done. Tommy, this is kind of what I was saying last week. Doing certain things, that's why we need to do this right, because we've already heard of two lawsuits tonight that have been filed, and who knows how many more are hidden out there. You know, the town needs to avoid any future litigation so mm -hmm. i'm glad we are working through this to, to come up with a with a right formula i second that that's it's just really i agree on that too that everybody's working together on this um no that's good so if anybody hears of any other we need to check on that would be great so that it's, it's uh, known right up front and be checked on from council. Um, so a couple other things. We, we had never had gotten any input on ZBA, and we do have somebody here tonight. Yes. Yeah, there's Linda. Did you have any input? Because we didn't have anybody to say anything last week, um, what we're doing. Well, this is my first time joining this group. Um, Andrew, uh, Jason, I think, was going to join, and then Andrew, and neither of them could. So now I'm the ZBA rep, I guess. But I don't have any information from prior to tonight. Yeah, I think going forward, we've kind of evolved our uh, thinking a little bit. So we're trying to get away from having either the planning board or the ZBA have an active administrative role in this. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my first questions last week. Um, if, if the other member had showed up to just get their feeling on it. So thank you. And the only other thing I, I had a question from, from people was, do we have a time, a date, a season, period, time period that they are allowed? Is that something that should be added to that application at the bottom? Anybody have any feeling on that or don't even bother with something like that? Uh, well, that is in the bylaw and it will be in the... Um, uh, not more than 179 consecutive days between May 1 and October 31 of each year. I guess we're covered there then. Good. And that is, uh, that conforms to the FEMA regulations. Mm. Yeah. And that should probably be in the document that the person is going to sign that they acknowledge that they will not have something there beyond these dates. That's a good idea. That would be great. Um, I had a question too, I don't know, Dee Dee or Tom. Um, when you got together the list of property owners, how many of them were out of towners? Maybe 10% or something like that? I'm just wondering how big a factor that might be in terms of being Except able to reach people. I, Tommy, you have that list, don't you? I have that list, but I don't, I didn't look into that. We can check yeah. into that though to see the percentages. Good question. I'm just wondering if that would affect to some degree how successful we are. 
So, so Johnny, do you know that um, if most of them, even if they're out of state, they, they probably still might camp there? I mean, are the majority of the property owners usually one of the campers? Majority of them are one of the campers that, that I've encountered. Um, like I said, there's, there's times when, when we were on Aqua Vita, my uncle had property or second cousin, whatever, um, to the east of us. And he had a couple campers there. There was a lot, one over for me. There was four or five there, but it was just a family. Um, I think they were from Westfield originally. And then, you know, they branch off, but it was all just their family. Yeah, the majority of most places, people that I've talked to, they're, they're definitely the owners are on the property. I mean, when it comes down to, I understand that um, they may live in a different area, but I mean, they do own property in Hadley. They pay the taxes. So, I mean, you can't, you can't really look at people that, that hey, you're an out of town or you're here. They, they're invested into your city and your town. So I just sometimes exactly. I kind of like to get that out there, you know, because I think people kind of forget that, yeah, you know, that they're, you know, they're all in one. You know, I understand they don't actually... They're putting their head on the pillow six months of the year, not 12 months. Well, yeah. right, because why would they want to own the property if they were out of town, it, uh, th- you know, so they could use it, so. It, exactly. Like, I I am not, a, um, you know, I don't have it anymore, but I had property in the Cape at one time. I, I was basically living at home, but I also had vested interest out there. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there, kind of like the Walmarts and everybody, you know, they may not live in the Walmart, they may not live in the Target, but they have vested interest into the town. I think the issue was more one of trying to reach them, wasn't it, Didi? Yeah, Yeah, I think that's what Stannis was bringing up, trying to get the word out to people who live out of town who may not be involved in the Hadley um, town meetings or looking at the bylaws. I think that was the idea behind it, not the fact that, hey, they live out of town. We don't want them here. Mm-hmm. Well, I think Paula, we were what? trying to think of doing maybe uh, just a letter. That's why we got all the um, property owners' names. So even just to send out a letter to inform people that you know aren't on here, like you said, um, of what's going on. Another thing on that that we've, we've been doing, um, actually Mark Britton has been posting on one of our Connecticut River pages to inform people of the meetings and what's happening. So through social media, we've been, we've been trying to notify as many people who have an interest on the river as well. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. So we'll add that, add that stuff and then we can probably, Chief, I'll, I can submit that into the next um, planning board meeting and let them take a look at all that as well and get, get their any other input the rest of the members want on that. And do you think next meeting they'll have a, you guys might vote on the actual amount or the square footage or whatever you'd like to put in the bylaw? Yeah, I think we're under some pressure to get a draft finished sooner rather than later. So, um, yeah, we'll probably be ready to to move on that. And we seem to have decent parameters here. The 25-foot spacing, minimum of 2,500 square feet per RV. Um, yep, that's... Do I need to add a um, board section? Is there a need for for a checklist for planning board or no? No. No. I don't think so, Jim. No, I think we're trying to we're trying to not build a, an ongoing role for ourselves in this one. Okay. We're just trying to get the bylaw to conform to the state and federal requirements. So basically, you know, you're going to, you have those perimeters and then conservation is going to have theirs. So it could cut down to, you know, the amount right there, but there's really, is there a need to go to ZBA at that point? I guess if they wanted to 
wanted to use only 2,000 square feet, that would be the only need they had to, or is it flat out not going to be able, you know, how would, how would that work? I, they'd have to go to them for a special permit to go under that amount. I, I suppose there could be on a lot by lot basis, a lot out there that could not, uh, could, could not support uh, two units where the owner wanted to put the unit and in that or, or someplace that might not you know, anything seems like anything would support one unit but um, just because of configuration or what have you lot shape which would be right under the ZBA's jurisdiction for an exception or a variance. So they, they may have a role going forward, but it'll be on a case by case basis and probably mostly for someone who otherwise wouldn't be able to get even one camper on one RV out there. But it would also still have required if the ZBA is going to have any part, it would have to be after the conservation department has determined. Definitely. Okay. Could I, 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 I got kicked out earlier and I just wanted to kind of ask a little question about, um, about the campers anyways. I know we're talking about conservation, but they, and I could have missed this because I, I lost internet connection. Um, but campers are basically removable off lots. So do they fall under like certain, because they're not permanent fixtures. And, and the reason why I'm asking this is like with conservation, I just wanted some um, lights shine on it. I'm not questioning anybody um, because boats are in the river and they're on docks, which are basically on top of the river. So if there was ever flooding, and as we know, Connecticut River, we have ample time knowing that it's going to crest. So that's where I'm kind of a little confused because we have Sports Marina, a Sportsman's Marina that has 300 boats. And we're talking about RVs that where sometimes it just kind of gets a little confusing because it's like, I think we have more to worry about if we ever had a big flood with, you know, because a lot of things coming down. But that's where I'm kind of talking about with the conservation. I just, with it being removable structures, um, how does that fall into place? Is that is it for you, Paula? Let, sorry. Yeah, the Wetlands Protection Act talks about alteration of the land. So cutting trees, cutting brush, um, any, you know, docks are permitted by the state. Those aren't permitted. There is some permitting by us but those docks are permitted separately. So being on the water, they have to have a permit for the certain number of docks that they have. Every dock is supposed to have a permit. Conservation Commission deals with um, wetlands, uh, you know, endangered species habitat, um, cutting of trees, cutting of brush, anything like that. Someone has a lot that they've never had a camper on and they want to go in and clear cut the lot. Well, they're going to have to go to the Conservation Commission for that. And they may not be allowed to clear as much as they want. Example I gave was the commission had to um, tell someone that unless they move their pavilion out of that first hundred feet, we couldn't grant them a permit. Their option was, well, we don't like the location where it would be more than a hundred feet away from the river. So we're just not going to have one. Okay. So pretty much. So the campers and stuff like that are not really kind of falling in that because they could be removed into and right off the lot. It's basically kind of the landscape and our area. So if people do have open fields already that they, I mean, cause honestly, we all know that this has been going on for a while and we're trying to catch up on, you know, the permit process and make sure that everybody falls into line. Um, but so that's where I was kind of just wanted to get that kind of information about like the 200 to the river. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what I'm kind of getting at with the campers because, you know, yeah. it's like, okay, you know, Oh, let me move my camper over more. Let me move it over more. I mean, when is it kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's just that you it's um, what I'm kind of getting at is that we just, there's just so much. And I just want, and this is just a consideration and a suggestion. We have so much time when we know that river is going to crest, we all know that. We know that like, you know, I mean, we, we get the warnings, we get this and everything. So we do have a lot of time to get campers off the river. We have a lot of time to get boats off the river, off the docks. That's where I'm kind of getting at just for other par um, property owners as well. Um, and that's what I mean. I mean, for us to really get that river to go crazy, 
we're basically going for like a you know like eight days of rain or you know um and plus all the snow is going to be melted by the time the campers are there and that's where i was just kind of just adding some information yeah any any type of a camper is considered putting a camper on a piece of land in there is considered an alteration so any type of an alteration requires the permit from the conservation commission whether you can move it or not that's just what the law says and the what about a boat trailer or what about a car uh two people talked at once i couldn't hear well is that considered okay so is that all right um i understand it's a but is that a temporary um because does the campers, so does it go back to normal when the camper is gone in the winter? Do you know what I'm saying? It just, it just seems like the law is kind of written a little different because yes, you are altering it to property, but all you're doing is putting something there. It's like me basically putting a piece of paper on something. Yes, I altered it for a second, but the camper is removable, which it actually returns it to this, its natural state. Maybe with a little bit of um, folded up grass underneath the tires, but it's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not like it's, um, it's not like it's, you know, there. That's where I'm. That's where I'm just confused. That's all, Paula. Alteration is alteration. Whether it's there for five minutes or six months, and then you move it, because when you have, when you're, if you're going to have a camper there, then you're going to have people there. You're going to have cars. Oh my there. god! So those are all the. Things. That's hey, what the law says. Can, can I? Can I? So, so you can't park a car in the riverbank? Is that what you're saying? Or you can't put a trailer or you can't sit on the grass and, and throw a fishing pole out, out in the river? I mean, this is, this is kind of getting ridiculous with these, what the restrictions conservation's coming up with here. Um, Mark, what you need to do is read the Wetlands Protection Act. We are, conservation is not coming up with this. This is a state law that has been in effect since the 70s and has been revised over time. That is a state regulation well, that the commission is required to enforce, just like the planning board enforces uh, under Mass General Law 40A. Well, I guess uh, that. I think that we need discretion. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't answer my question though. So you're telling me I can't park a car or a boat trailer or any type of thing that has tires within 200 feet of the river uh, does that go for snowmobiles? Because I, I'm pretty sure the Hadley Snowmobile Club has snowmobile trails that are within the boundaries of that 200 foot. Uh, people also ride dirt bikes and quads. I mean, I, you, you gotta you gotta be more specific with with these examples. We're using campers, but there's a lot of other things in the world that have wheels. So all of those things should have permits from the concert. A lot of those things should have permits. Mm -hmm from the Conservation Commission. I'm just, you know, this is about- well, is it a How lot can they get a permit it, first? But oh, here, here's the thing, is it is it a lot or is it all of them? It, it's, it's either yes or no. There's no, a lot of them doesn't make any sense because now you're, you're playing favorites. There, there's favoritism going on here. So if you're gonna run a, mo you're gonna ride your mountain bike along the river bank, you need to pull a permit for that? Is that what you're telling me? If you are establishing, there is a mountain biking club that establishes a trail, then that trail is altering the landscape, just like up along uh, Mount Holyoke in that range, they came before the Conservation Commission for certain permits because they are altering the land. So depending on the type of alteration, that's why I can't say yes or no, depending on the type of alteration, it may require just a request for determination or it may require a notice of intent. Paula, so I have a question that might be a little more pertinent, like pertaining to this. So say Gary Pell's here, Sports Arena. You put your boat in, you park your trailer up there. Some trailers stay there for the whole season while people are docked. I know some people bring them to their homes or whatever, but is, is that whole area now do you need to go for every time you bring a boat trailer or see yeah. even a resident that lives within the um 200 he, feet like a house on aquavita yeah he has a permit to operate a marina mm -hmm. and all the things that go with the marina 
just like with the campers, if you are getting a permit from the commission to do it, you are getting a permit that will show where the camper is, where the area is, um, that you're not going to, you know, clear every piece of vegetation on the lot. Those are the types of things that you would have to show and you would abide by in your permit. Okay. Can I show we'll something? That. Oh, yes. Um, Hello? Yeah, so you could see what we're kind of getting at. There's just so many different scenarios and there has to be some type of discretion that has to be taken here. I mean, because, you know, I mean, honestly, I guarantee you the, um, the board didn't really go over and go, oh my God, Gary, um, there's four tires that are on the grass and they folded it over. So now you have to go in front of the conservation commission for another permit. That's where I'm kind of saying, I just think that, that we just need a little more clarity and just a little bit more um, where there has to be some discretion um, just because there's, you know, there's other different scenarios. That's why I asked the question. And there's a big difference between operating a marina which he has filed multiple notice of intents with the commission and got multiple permits, gotten the permits from the state for the docks to operate a marina. Um, he has gone through multiple layers. And when the commission usually has a square where it says, this is the area, this is the limit of the work that you're doing. So, if you're moving the camper over 10 feet and you're within that limit of work, well, hey, you're within your limit of work. You don't need to get a new permit for that. Ash, may, may I speak? Go ahead, iPhone Don. Um, Hurricane uh, Irene, I think it was 2006 or seven. We all got warned that it was going to flood. And we went down there, we got all our stuff off off the property, the campers, uh, everything, bikes, whatever. We were out there in like four hours. The houses on Aqua Vita Road got flooded. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of stuff, campers and everything else, that were got flooded. So I don't understand the problem. And this is a gray area. We we're able to get out in two, three hours, get the campers, everything else, and the houses on Aqua Vita Road don't get anything out. And they're still flooded. Um, well, I'm not sure. The com it isn't a matter of whether or not you can remove materials from the property. It's considered any form of an alteration, and there's a very detailed um, definition of what alteration is under the Wetlands Protection Act. If you are altering your property in any way, shape, or form, then that requires a permit from the conservation. Yes, I understand you need a permit, but what good is the permit if everybody's flooding? Well, slowly but surely, either the houses are being brought up to code, raised, or removed. Those are grandfathered. Most of those houses that get flooded down there are grandfathered. Any new houses um, have to be built so they are not flooded and this is at the beginning of the meeting, we talked about that if you alter a property within a certain percentage, you have to bring that up to code where you might have to raise that house above the floodplain elevation. Which is, 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 I totally understand that, but it's still a permanent fixture and a camper's not. That's where I, see, that's where I'm kind of getting Exactly, confused. exactly. Well, a gray area. Well, alteration is alteration. That's under but, the Weapons Protection well, Act. I don't they like alterate their, They alterate their backyards. They, everything in their backyard is alterated to the riverfront, cutting trees, everything else. It's alterated. Uh, so there's no difference. It's not grandfathered in any way, shape, or form. People have to come before the Conservation Commission. There have been a number been of there. over the past year when you've had trees come down. Um, if you're going to remove stumps or there's trees that are endangering a structure, people have had to file the permits with the Conservation Commission to remove the tree within those areas. So if you've been there, you understand that there are certain yes. triggers that require it. I don't yes. write the regulations. Right? No, I, I, know, 
I, I know that, but now you're coming down on the campers to get a permit. How about the people that live on Aqua Vida and they got boats and campers in their backyard? Did they have to get a permit? Those structures and that are grandfathered. If they oh, are. I, okay. I think what he's saying, like, say a house is on Aqua Vida and they have a boat trailer parked on the side of their driveway mm -hmm. on their yard. Okay. Does that need a permit? If Janice worked full time, 40 hours a week, and we had another person doing enforcement, then yeah, they probably would. We don't have that, we don't have that ability. So we, when people are talking about new alterations in there. Um, it's not new. It's old stuff that's been around since the 50s. The houses, the backyards, they've been right. there a long time. There's nothing new about it. So those, some of those things are grandfathered. If they want to do an addition onto a house that was grandfathered. I, I understand that 100%. It, it's, it's I'm not going like, to regulate, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not going like to regulate the, someone you know, are there for right. you know, a week or two versus having a I think you're just... I think you discriminate in the, the campers that are on the river. Well, you can you can uh, agree to disagree oh. with me on that. I think we're a little off, we're off here. Right. Um, the development regulation in Massachusetts is complex. Some will say overly complex. Uh, there are overlapping jurisdictions. It, it's the way it is, but we're not going to fix that here. I want to reiterate that um, the reason the pl uh, planning board is involved and the reason the, we're working with the zoning bylaw is that the way our bylaw is written uh, basically says if it's not permitted in the bylaw, it is prohibited. So we drafted this bylaw originally to allow you to legitimately use your land along the river to park a camper. Because before the 1990s, when we adopted the bylaw, that was prohibited because it wasn't permitted. Yeah, so, because it was, it was considered a mobile home, not, an arc, not a recreational vehicle. It was not permitted. So we drafted the bylaw to give people the opportunity to legitimately use their land for the purposes they wanted to use it for. And likewise, we are now trying to eat, trying to simplify that bylaw to let it be as easy as possible, and I say easy as possible, for people to continue to use their land. But the bylaw is a very small par part of it. Uh, zoning is a very small part of it. We're, we're, we're okay with you being there. That's why we're pushing this. Uh, but you do have to also comply with every other applicable regulation. And there are a lot of them. And I agree, which I have been doing. The only thing okay. I have a problem, Good. the only thing I have a problem with is having to pay a hundred dollar permit for every for my son and my daughters to be there when I own that property and I've owned it since 1992. And I've done everything I was supposed to do, buying sand camp permits, everything. That's my problem. Okay, so Tom, Chief, you're going to revise the checklist. Yes. Uh, next planning board meeting is in two weeks. I don't know if we, there's any point in this group meeting sometime next week to... Uh, to update or or just let it let, let it go yeah, until after the let uh, it go we can send the revised out to, to everybody and and uh look at it and then i'll present it to your meeting and then hopefully have everything wrapped up and meet one more time like on say the third the 23rd after your meeting okay i will work on um polishing up uh an edited rv section of the bylaw and uh it, apparently we're not talking really about anything else in the um uh 
bylaw beyond the RVs that everybody, no one has raised any concerns about anything else, which really just builds on what we have already. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to circulate a revised draft. Um, yeah, I can circulate it to this board. I can't, I'm, I, unfortunately, I can't circulate it back to my own board. Well, yeah, I can, but we just can't discuss it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll get it out there and we'll, um, we'll, we will take it up as part of our meeting on the 16th. And um, then we can maybe meet the following, I guess, the following Thursday. Thursday, which or the Thursday or Tuesday. So the planning board meeting is the 16th. Yeah, so the 18th, uh, okay. I know the selectmen will be meeting on the 17th. So okay. the 18th would be two weeks from tonight. Yep. Perfect. I was thinking the following Tuesday, but let's do that if that works for everybody on the committee. Can I ask Paulette one more question, and hopefully it's a softball one? Go for um, it. Sure. <laughs> Paulette, a, a, a field that's been cleared for 10 years has always had campers on it. Do you envision any issues with conservation putting those campers there continually? No, no structures, no cutting of trees, no anything that this is just going to be doing what they've always done, the field exists, and you're just going to be pulling the campers in and pulling them out. Well, here's the question. Did you get an original permit from the Conservation Commission? Um, I'm, well, again, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm at, let's say no. Let's say no. Let's go with okay. no. Then you're illegal under the Conservation but, but, Commission Act. Correct. So I'm asking going forward. That's, that's why I'm asking you going forward. Yeah. Is that, that I, I'm assuming, is that what, you know, we're just talking about an open field, pulling it. A, a camper in, pulling the camper out. Do you see any issues with that through conservation? Are you going to mow around the camper? You're going to put uh, chairs or mats down? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're asking me the same kind of thing. So if if you look in your chat, hang on. If you look in the chat, Janice posted um, the DEP makes no distinction between temporary or permanent structures within a buffer zone or wetland. And the alter definition includes changing of pre-existing drainage characteristics, flood patterns, flood retention areas, destruction of vegetation, changing of water temps, and a whole other slew of things. So that's, she didn't write the entire definition, but those are all oh. the things that are in there. So Paula, what he's saying, a field that's been mowed, you put your yeah. camper there and you're going to continue to mow around your camper. You still need a permit because you didn't so, get a permit originally. Okay, so if somebody lives on Aquavita and mows their lawn and they're within 200 feet of the river, they're illegal. No, because those houses were there prior to this provision going into the Wetlands Act. What if they didn't mow their lawn? Okay, I'm not even going to entertain that, John. Come on. Well, let's, let's... I mean, really. Let's move on. So... It'll be um, planning in the 16th. I will go and, and um, be there. And then I'll, I'll go to the select board with the fees, run that by them. And then we'll meet again at six o'clock on the 18th, Thursday. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> and we'll get everything sent out prior to the planning and um, also send it, you know, any other changes or whatever before the following meeting. Can I ask one more question too, before you shut down? Sure. Are, are you going to come up with some kind of fines? for people that don't follow this? Will that fall under whatever you have now for building inspector fines? Or I'm just thinking that there could be an instance where someone refuses to f file and needs to, or doesn't stay with the number of RVs if they say, or something like that, you know, just to have something in place. I think you That's a good, good question. Good question. It would be a, a, a non-criminal ticket. Yeah. You know, so usually it's a warning and then a hundred dollar, then a 500, then a thousand dollar non, you know, ticket. Uh -huh. So if this is under zoning. It would probably fall under that. Correct. Okay. And then of course you have whatever, as far as conservation, what, what you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. 
Thank you. All right. With that, all right. good night all. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Hey, thank I, you. Just, I just wanted to say uh, thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Bill, for, for trying to work with the landowners. We really appreciate it.